The lower face is defined really just off the basis of the mid face definition. So essentially the lower boundary of the mid face and below. So that's a line from the lower tragal notch to the oral commissure. Vertically, obviously there's a medial separation right down the middle. And then we go down to the angle of the mandible and the inferior border of the mandible. Angela's lower face is wider than her mid face. I propose that we use botulinum toxin in order to reduce down the masteric bulk in order to narrow Angela's face at this point. But we must also consider the chin area in order to complete the lower third of the face. If I turn Angela to the side, we can see that Angela has got a mild class 2 skeletal base, which means that her maxilla is stronger than her mandible and projection of that mandible is not only going to improve Angela's profile but it's going to pick up a little bit of redundant tissues at the jowl area and it's going to complete her lovely natural strong jawline. Turn to the front again for me. Narrowing of the chin using dermal fillers again is going to improve the projection of the chin and it's also going to balance more with the central proportions of her face and improve Angela's beautiful, strong jawline. Finally, I'm going to consider the assessment of the perioral area. Whenever I look at Angela at rest, her lips are beautiful with regards to the reflection along the vermilion border and the proportions of her upper and her lower lip are very nice as well. When I ask, can I ask you to kiss Angela? We can see weakening, early weakening of the vermilion border and potentially a little bit of volume loss, maybe in the lower lip. What I propose in order to create a nice natural rejuvenation of the lip area is using a soft filler to restore the strength of the vermilion border and perhaps a small amount of a more volumizing filler in order to slightly volumize the lower lip. The next thing to look at is the masseter muscle. Can you turn to the side for me? Clench your teeth as hard as you can. So the masseter is a very strong muscle. When we ask our patient to clench our teeth, we can palpate it easily. Anterior border, posterior border. I can feel with my finger the edge of the mandible. And all I'm gonna do is three dots in a little triangle right into that area. Turn this way for me. So this treatment is to debulk um, Angela's masseter muscle and to complement the dermal filler treatment that we're doing to try and rebalance the, the increase in the zygomatic the bi-zygomatic distance mm -hmm. to make it a little bit wider than the bigonial distance. Actually, absolutely, yeah. just trying to narrow this down a little bit, just to feminize and yeah. soften that jawline. Yeah, perfect. The final area with the toxin is the mentalis muscle. Now the mentalis is a strong muscle of the chin. It inserts into the bone of the chin and it runs superiorly, inserts into the skin of the, the chin and the fibers of Abicularis auris. And it's responsible for eversion of the lower lip. So I'm gonna ask Angela to demonstrate the movement that that muscle is responsible for because that will allow me to palpate the muscle and feel exactly where to inject. Angela, if you see me do this movement here, can you do that? Put out your lower lip. Push your lower lip forward, that's it, perfect. When we do that, we can feel easily where that muscle is. And we're gonna do one injection into each belly of that muscle. Mm -hmm. And part of that contraction has actually resulted from the loss of support of the bone. So using the dermal filler that we're going to use later on is going to work synergistically with this toxin treatment that we're going to do as well, isn't it? That's right. So we're going to be injecting into masseter. If you clench your teeth again for me, we can feel the contraction of that masseteric muscle. I think in this occasion, I'm going to use four units per injection but sometimes you have to go up to six or eight for somebody who has got a much higher degree of muscle hypertrophy. Right, Angela, so this is a deep injection into the deep muscle. And we're gonna inject four units. And again. And one final injection. We can reassess in two weeks, and if we need any more, we can add to that. This is considered, you know, by convention, an advanced injection technique. But you know, in reality, treating the upper part of the face is, is difficult. It's very difficult to get a truly beautiful, natural, aesthetic outcome. 
But the masseter is, I think, a much simpler proposition. It's got three simple injections into a very big muscle, very difficult to miss. Yes, the oh, only risk is potentially injecting too far anteriorly and catching like maybe rosorius muscle. That is um, true. And weakening the corner, um, which I've heard other practitioners talk about that being a complication yeah. and patient having difficulty sort of uh, clearing food from buccal sulcuses um, and potentially um, speaking as well. Close up. Or smiling, yeah. the smile is asymmetric. Okay. We need more cameras. Mentalis. So finally we're going to inject Mentalis. Yes, yeah, we've already marked the muscle. So we're just going to palpate. Do that thing again, just so I can feel that muscle. Okay, relax, that just gives me the confidence. We're in exactly the right place. And I'm going to do four units into each side. Three, two, one, there we go. Draw slowly, and we're going to do the same on the other side, just here. Three, two, one, there we go. And four units on there. Now, you might have noticed that I was just tapping the surface of the skin immediately before I injected that. That's kind of a, a distraction technique. Particularly with anxious patients, it can make it a little bit more comfortable for them. There we go. And that's all we're going to be doing with toxins. So let's move on to the dermal fillers. Now, you remember from Angela's assessment and discussions at the beginning, there's an issue of lengthening of the chin to elongate the lower third, but there's also that element of projection. So what I want to do is inject on a point that gives me both lengthening and projection. With a chin, it's actually relatively straightforward to do, and it's, it's a fairly simple concept. If we inject underneath the mandibular rim, we get elongation. If we inject on the anterior, we get anterior projection. And if we inject on the junction between the two, we get a combination of the two. So we can model our implant to give us exactly the projection that we want. The injections have to be directly onto the bone. This can be done with a cannula, but it can be uncomfortable for the patient. So I'm going to be using a 27 gauge needle here. And the reason I choose the 27 gauge needle is because the uh, TSK27 has actually got a hollower diameter or a hollower bore. So the internal diameter is actually larger than you'd expect, which means the extrusion force of the syringe is actually quite low, making it really simple and pleasurable almost to inject. Yep. I'm going to do a series of five bolus injections in a row from patient's right to patient's left. So we'll start with the first injection. I keep the thumb just on the side of my mark. This mark is the the line of the intercanthal line. It's a, a vertical drop from the intercanthal line, left and right. I keep a thumb just on the left because I don't want my product to bleed to the side. I want it to stay in the front. I've marked the inferior border and we're just going to go right into that corner. Little scratch, three, two, one. Slowly introduce the needle until I'm touching the bone. And when I'm touching the bone, do a little bit of negative pressure to aspirate. And then slowly inject a bolus of 0.2 mils. And we Draw the plunger, withdraw the syringe. That's really nice. It's actually just that one thing, it just lifts that forward. It pulls the pre gel forward. It's, it's brilliant. I love doing this. Okay, and we're going to do the same on the other side. Little bolus for 0.2, just medial to that line which I've marked, which is a vertical drop off, and just above the line that I've marked, which is just underneath the border of the mandible. We're going to go straight down to the bone, little injection, three, two, one, here we go. Touching the bone there. Okay, I'm going to reposition actually. Okay. 
aspirate. Keep the tip of my needle in contact with the bone whilst I change my hand, otherwise there's no point in aspirating. And then slowly inject a bolus of 0.2 mils. Again, exactly the same on the other side. I can feel Can feel the product moving against my finger. And filling out that space. Okay. Swap, please. Thank you. Thanks. Can I get a fresh needle, please? Yeah. So each time I inject a bolus onto the bone, in any patient, for any indication, I change the needle over because an unprimed needle, in my opinion, is less likely to give me an aspiration if I'm in a blood vessel. I know there's been papers that have been written that are suggesting that there's absolutely no point aspirating because it doesn't make any difference. It, it may be the case. It doesn't hurt me to aspirate. I'm still going to do it. I agree. Agree? Yes. We've had positive aspirations in the past, so we should carry on. So I've done my lateral injections. We're going to do a central one, and then we're just going to do a fifth after one, uh, a fourth and a fifth in between the two. Three, two, one. Okay, directly down to the bone. Keep the tip of the needle in contact with the bone. Aspirate. Three, two, one. Relax. And then a slow bolus. I have to count my aspirations either in my head or out loud because I'm impatient. I think that's a trait in common with most people who trained as surgeons. So you're placing your finger underneath so mm -hmm. that you're guiding the potential migration of the filler. That's it, yeah. You know, this is something we do with every injection, isn't it? Yeah. It's a two-handed thing. The, the non-dominant hand is, is guiding, is preventing migration. It's putting the product where you want it to go. And it's giving you tactile feedback as to what that product feels like, how far it's pushing, which way it's going, which I think is one of the things that really helps, you know, guide our injection technique, rather than just putting bolus, bolus, bolus in these predetermined marks. Got to have hands-on, you know, you've got you've to feel what it's doing there. Yeah. Okay. One more. Three, two, one. Exactly the same process. Okay, and we'll aspirate. Three, two, one. Count slowly. Change position. Tip of my needle not moving. And I've got another hand. Always have to have a finger, a thumb. Telling me what that filler is doing where I can't see it. Point two. Excellent. And just one more. And your chin will be amazing. So here's something. It's so subtle. It's, it's amazing. So we, we do myomodulation with toxin, mu uh, virtual and neurotoxin to relax the muscle but actually the volumization, getting that volume back underneath the muscle to stretch it, little scratch, three, two, one, touching the bone. Well, absolutely aspirate. makes sense, doesn't it? It pushes if it you've back out, yeah. lost support from that bone and fat atrophy, yeah. just as a consequence of age, the muscle contracts and lifts and compensates for the lack of support. So what we're doing is just replacing that support. Yeah, that's it. I think, you know, with the, what we see is hyperactive mentalis muscles in older patients who've got volume loss, both bony and fat. And it's that, I, we, I think it's that volume loss mm -hmm. that, you know, it kind of, it reduces the apparent length of the muscle from its origin to its insertion, doesn't it? Yeah. So the tone increases mm -hmm. and you get more dimpling, more hyperactivity, hyperkinesis. And then when we revolumize that, 
it smooths. The, the peau d'orange improves. Can you push your lower lip forward for me? See the difference between that now and 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Although I will admit there's an element of anaesthetic <laughs> in the filler as well. And funnily enough, Angela's concern was that projecting her chin was going to give her a witchy chin. Completely the opposite. Um, as people sort of age, they're perceived to have that witchy chin because of the contraction of that mentalis yeah. and the upturning of the chin. And actually, this has completely the opposite effect. Very, very nice. I love that chin. I'm now going to inject in the mesolabial area in order to complete the transition between the submalar zone into the augmented chin. So just turn this way for me. So I'm going to use a 23 gauge introducing needle. I'm just going to insert the needle through the skin. And then can I have um, Bellatero Intense with a 25 gauge one and a half inch cannula, please? Sure, have a little swab. I'm going to use Bellatero Intense for this indication because it's a nice, soft, elastic filler that will lift. Thanks. I'm just going to show you this because this is really cool. Yeah, I just really like this actually. It helps me sort of, you know, not just keep everything tidy, but it's easy to drop the, the cannulas back in without risking contamination. So you can pull that there. Thank there you. you go. And it just stays there like that. Okay, so I'm priming my 27 gauge, one and a half inch Steriglite with the port at the end of the cannula. Turn your face that way. And we're just going to place the cannula through the skin into the subcutaneous plane. And we can just guide that cannula through the subcutaneous and then start depositing fine lines of the filler as required. So I really love um, using cannulas, especially steriglides, because they do glide underneath the tissue. Yeah, I mean, remember the ones we used to use before this? We've been using these for a long time, but yes. the, even the original ones, it, they, they just seem to grate a little bit. You had a little bit more tethering. Yeah. I think we're getting a lot less trauma with, with these. Yeah, they absolutely do just glide underneath the tissues. Mm. But also, how much more artistic can you be with your treatment planning? You know, you can just access so many more areas and you can make sure that you're consistent in the planar placement of your product. Yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, originally we felt when they first invented these micro cannulas, it was like you're almost, you know, you're fighting the tissues, aren't you, to get your product to a place and put it in and come out. But now, where well, you can move it around gently underneath the tissues mm -hmm. and with the right products, yeah. you, can, you can really smooth where you need to smooth and volumize where you need to volumize. Yes. So again, it all comes down to knowing your anatomy product choice, knowing the rheology, the characteristics, the personality of the products, and matching that up with the assessment that you carry out mm. and the treatment plan, the individual treatment plan that you, you have made for that patient to deliver the most natural rejuvenation that you can possibly do. It's a complicated process. There's so many steps involved in, you know, just the whole picture. There is, yes. So, that's actually amazing. Can you see the, the smoothness, the junction? I can. Yeah. It's, it's, it's there. It's you just compare lost that, to that side, shadow. Yeah. We've, we've got that little, you know, mm -hmm. fullness on this side, mm -hmm. and it's really lifted out. The, mm -hmm. the, the chin implant did a fair amount of actually just pulling forwards. Yeah. You know, it really makes it. That the massively the impacts on the jowl, doesn't it? It does. So you've got that vertical elevation with the cheek augmentation, but that anterior projection is mm. also really important in treating early jowls. I'm going to finish off by treating the vermilion border of Angela's lips. Now, lip augmentation and lip rejuvenation are very complex treatments. The um, lip anatomy is quite complex as well. You know, we've got three tissues that are in the lip, the cutaneous lip, the vermilion border and the oral mucosa, and they all have really different anatomical structures and they have to be treated individually and with different products as well to really get that natural rejuvenation. Now with Angela's lips in particular, we really only need to support the vermilion border. She doesn't need any volumization or projection of her upper or lower lip. 
just when Angela is pursing, we can see a, a weakness in the vermilion border that's starting to lead to the development of perioral lines. However, whenever we look at Angela's lips, she's got beautiful shape. She's got a lovely um, white halo that runs around the um, oral mucosa, giving this lovely light reflection, and that's something that we've really got to maintain. For that reason, I've chosen to use Bellatero Balance. Now, Bellatero Balance is a beautiful product that can be placed intradermally and integrates really nicely to lift where it needs to lift and integrate and blend where it needs to blend. I'm going to use um, a technique called intradermal blanching, and this is absolutely specific to Bellatero Balance. And what I'm doing is placing the filler along the vermilion border intradermally so it's locked in among those collagen fibres so you do not get migration up or down um, of this filler. So it gives you an immediate good result that will, um, will last for the duration of the filler. So let's start. So I'm using Bellatero Balance on a TSK 30 gauge needle. The vermilion border is one millimetre thick or less. Therefore, we must use a, uh, an appropriate needle size and we have to use um, a 30 gauge needle or a smaller needle in order to maintain in that intradermal plane. The TSK needle um, is by far the, the superior needle um, choice for this treatment because it maintains its integrity and also because of the wide lumen in the 30 gauge needle, um, it allows the flow of the bilateral balance through the needle into the tissues. So what we're going to do is start at the oral commissure of the upper lip. The bevel is up and we're going to go into the oral commissure as close to the corner of the lip as we can and we're going to maintain a depth of just in the dermis. So we should see the grey of the needle and we should also see the dermal filler as we place it into the vermilion border. I'm going to use no more than 0.05 with every pass. With every injection point, I move into an area with dermal filler. Because of the local anaesthetic is there, it makes it more comfortable for the patient. We go all the way up to the cupid's bow. And we can also treat into the cupid's bow. Only pinpoint bleeding is observed during this treatment and um, because of the depth of product placement. Okay, so we can see from the untreated side that there is weakness at the vermilion border, which is restored on the side that we have treated the vermilion border. We can see that there's maintenance of that white halo that runs around the lip and a natural result. Can I have the needle again? For this treatment, it's really important that we use a needle rather than a cannula. This is an intradermal treatment and unfortunately, we are unable to use a cannula intradermal. So if we place a cannula in the vermilion border, we're in the subcutaneous plane and unfortunately, any filler that's placed in the subcutaneous plane at the vermilion border can either move superiorly into the cutaneous lip or inferiorly into the oral mucosa. So we'll do the lower lip. Again, we'll start at the oral commissure. We'll retract the skin with a non-dominant hand and we'll place the needle through the dermis of the vermilion border. The vermilion border is a really interesting structure. It has no hair follicles, no sweat glands, um, and no pigment skin, and no pigment cells as well. Hence, the lovely white halo that runs around a natural, youthful lip.
So that's all Angela's treatment finished for today. All that's left is for me to give Angela post-operative care instructions and to arrange a review in two weeks. At that review appointment, I'm going to find out that everything has settled in really nicely and Angela's delighted about the results. And at that point, I'll be able to plan her future treatment need and get her organized for her next appointment. The treatments that we just demonstrated are part of the parcel of what we teach at the Aesthetic Training Academy. We have a range of courses that start with intermediate and introductory courses if you're just getting started. But when we get beyond that, we really don't like the, the technique-driven approach or the product-driven approach or the area-driven approach because patients don't really come for an area and they shouldn't. So what we do is we take a full holistic assessment approach. What can we do with our treatment, with our cannula, with our needle, for our patient as a whole, enhance that overall beauty? And this, this is the approach that we like and we think gets better injectors to do better treatments and get better outcomes for our patients. Simon and I love training. We spend probably 50% of our working life now doing teaching and training in addition to treatments within the clinic. So if you would like to come and learn more about what we have learned over the last 15, 16 years in practice and attending different conferences and different training events, then you can get in touch with us by contacting us via our website, which is www.ataglasgow.co.uk or email us at inquiries at ataglasgow.co.uk.